Last week we finished actually reading Genesis 1. And there were a few things that I wanted to say that I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have time to do it. So I was thinking we could do it tonight before starting with the second chapter. Um, as an introduction, like scripture tells us, we are to study all things. We should take that which is good and discard that which isn't. To begin with the study, I wanted to do an introduction regarding what we are going to see tonight because unfortunately in Christianity mainly, pastors throughout the decades, they kind of have put a lot of fear in the minds and the hearts of their sheep um, because of lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, for not having the spirit of truth and other reasons, they have come to fear knowledge, different types of knowledge or different types of books like, for instance, the Gnostic books or the Ap Apocrypha or other types of books that they took out of the scriptures or that they never put uh, as part of the scriptures in different times of history. So in Christianity, they basically have taught people not to read scriptures, mainly. I mean, that's amazing. For some reason, um, well, we know the reasons, control and many other things. It started with Catholicism. They decided that people should not read the scriptures, so they actually would read the scriptures in Latin so that people would not understand it. And when people started to translate it and read them, um, the church didn't like it and started killing people. And then eventually they did not have a choice but to allow people to read it. And eventually then came uh, Martin Luther and he saw that in scriptures there were a bunch of things that the church was not following. So he made a list of those things and basically went against the church giving birth to the Protestant church and basically uh, all the denominations that came after that like Evangelical and Advent, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist and Methodist and all of those that actually originated from that moment in which Martin Luther read the scriptures saw that there was a bunch of things that were wrong and tried to teach the people about it and that led to a lot of positive things but also to a lot of confusion and like I said hundreds of denominations that exist in Christianity nowadays so um, like I said the church that has had power over most religions in the world has had a plan not to allow people to read scriptures. That was their idea because if they did, they would notice that scripture speaks about that church as the whore of Babylon, the harlot. So that's why they don't want people to read the scriptures because Yahushua said, truth will set you free and they don't want people to be free. They want people as slaves uh, working for them. So, um, they also made people be afraid of um, the book of Revelation, for instance. That's the main book that they try to put fear in the hearts of people so that people would, will not want to read it. Uh, they also tell people that, they, that if they read the scriptures too much, they will go crazy or that they are not smart enough to understand scriptures etc etc so there are many reasons why people do not read scriptures nowadays they just want a preacher a pastor to tell them uh, what scripture say says not even uh, read scriptures but basically explain in a nutshell like unfortunately nowadays also there's lack of pa patience in society so people want everything like right now they want a quick fix so um 
people basically don't read scriptures as you may know or will come to know eventually what we do in this congregation is mainly read scriptures every time that we sit here to read we read well at least we try one chapter and um, maybe just half a chapter if there's too much to speak about so in this instance uh since we just read the chapter one of genesis and there are certain things that i would like to mention that connect with it however that information comes from other books basically or mainly from judaism uh and that is the reason why kind of i wanted to make this exp explanation because if in christianity they have fear they actually fear reading the book which the almighty gave them imagine the fear that they actually have regarding all the books that are outside of their religion so that's that is why when somebody mentions something that basically doesn't have to do with christianity directly people discard it people um reject it basically uh immediately because they think that it will go against what they believe and they don't want to deal with it because normally they don't know how to defend what they believe because they don't know the scriptures that they claim that they believe in so they don't want to uh, have to deal with other teachings other information that may bring down their beliefs their doctrine so there are many reasons why they have put that fear in the hearts of people so that they do not study their own scriptures and if they do not study their own scriptures there's even a, a less possibility that they will study any other book they will study a book written by a pastor like Joel Austin or something like that but not information that comes from scriptures or that is directly about scriptures um, or that should have been in the scriptures and that is what I'm talking about right now in first of Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 21 It says, test all things, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So, test all things. We should test everything. Meaning, if we go to a congregation and they are teaching a doctrine that it is new for you, you should test it. You should not reject it right away. And you should not accept it right away. You should pay attention. Find the reasoning behind it. The logic behind it. The scriptures that support it. Etc. And just like when you do that. When you go to a congregation. Or you go to a place to hear something about scriptures. Uh, you should test all things. The scripture also tells us. That we should test the spirits. Like for instance. When you say a word. A spirit comes out of your mouth so each word is a spirit therefore every name is a spirit that is why for instance when we come to the revelation that the actual name of the most high is Yahweh and the name of his son is Yahushua we should test those names because Yahweh tells us and gives us permission test all things so if for instance before I would call the names as everybody calls them like God or Jesus or Jehovah things like that and I would not see the results that I would expect as a believer or uh, according to what scripture says a bunch of other things but I would still do it because I had faith in that in those names when this knowledge came to me about the names according to scriptures I was supposed to test it so I put it before the Almighty I tested the names and I realized that what I was lacking, now I had it. What I, I thought I was supposed to receive when praying or when asking the Almighty for something, 
I started receiving it when I started using the names. And many other things, of course. So my point is, the scripture allows us to test all things. And then, after we test, hold fast what is good. So we should hold that which is good. So I have permission to read, study, all things. You can read any book. But, of course, you have to know where you are standing. That is, on the rock, which is Yahushua, the Messiah. So, when you are standing on Yahushua and you know that that is the basis of your belief, meaning the scriptures, then you can read all things and test them. How can you test them? When you put them next to scriptures. And then you will see if they're going to fall or they're going to stand. And if they stand, then you can use it to keep building and keep learning, keep growing. So, after, when it comes to me, my life, my experience, the Almighty revealed His name to me when I was around 23 years old. But I was already studying scriptures uh, before that and studying regarding the Illuminati and all of that. When I received the name, I tested it and it became, I mean, it came out like gold, like scripture tells us. Because through it, Yahweh gave me the kingdom, just like obviously every cho every person who receives the name and takes it and does everything that the person who has that name told us to do. So after that, many other revelations came and I started studying a lot of other things and a lot of, I mean, basically I... There are hundreds of denominations, so I would lie if I would say that I study each and every uh, Christian denomination that exists. But I did try to study at least the main Christian denominations um, to see either if they were right or if there was something that was going against scriptures. Basically what I was saying, I started testing doctrines. Mormons, wit uh, the witnesses, the... Um, Advent, uh, the Seven Day Adventist, the Methodist, etc., and there was always something that did not fit scriptures. So, the same way, I studied a little bit of well, I studied um, to see what the Quran says and what the Muslims believe. Also, to be able, obviously, to defend what I believe against a person who may believe a, one of those religions, one of those doctrines. And then also I study Judaism to see what it is that they believe or how they teach it. And, and actually I got a good surprise when it comes to the knowledge that at least they um, manage because there is no comparison when it comes to the knowledge, if I can say, if I can say, and I don't want to disrespect nobody, but what they share in the Christian churches. In Christian churches, they don't share knowledge. And when they do, it's just a little bit. Because what they do is actually manage the emotions in people um, and many other things to keep them happy for another week. In Judaism, they accept, they recognize that they do not have the spirit of prophecy. And that is... Uh, we know the reason why they don't know it, but we know the reason because it is in scriptures. It is because they rejected the Messiah. When you reject the testimony of the Messiah, you are rejecting the, test, the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Yahushua the Messiah according to the book of Revelation 19. So, um, there are many things that I started seeing in what they teach because they recognize that they, don't, they do not have the spirit of prophecy but they do talk about a lot of knowledge that it is found in scriptures and and i found that very very nice so that led me to many other things which um it is taught by people who do not believe in the messiah i want to make that clear it is taught by people that do not believe in the messiah and sometimes it is even taught or followed by 
people who use it to do wrong because it is knowledge of the spiritual world so there are people who use it not to please the almighty but to know how to mm, i don't know influence basically the spiritual world so with this in mind test all things hold fast what is good abstain from every form of evil we have the permission to study all things test them according to scriptures and then uh, take it if it's good and reject it if it's evil so there is a a branch of judaism or teachings of judaism which many people are afraid of and that is the kabbalah kabbalah means uh, something that is passed down generation through generation through words, through tradition, basically. So the word Kabbalah is just by itself. The definition is not uh, something evil. However, the knowledge that it is taught in it has been used by some that have uh, gone astray from the right way which as we know the only way to the father is is uh, Yahushua the Messiah whom they did not accept like I said Kabbalah it is translated as received tradition but they also translated as corresponding or parallel and because of what I have studied of it, um, when it comes to that word parallel, uh, parallel, I can see it as the fact that through the knowledge that I have found in it, I have seen parallels with what we see in scriptures. And that is basically what I wanted to show tonight with a little bit of information. Because that is my main point. I have come to all this knowledge that people... Who do not believe in the Messiah teach but when I found this knowledge and I tested it according to scriptures I saw that that knowledge actually confirms that the Messiah is Yahushua so that's why I use it of course but I found it found it amazing that they teach it they have this knowledge they've, they've had it for hundreds of years and they still do not recognize Yahushua as the Messiah even though there are so many things that go hand in hand or are parallel. Another thing that I don't, or that I'm, how can I say it, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable about talking about these subjects, and that's why I made this huge introduction, is the fact that, like I said, many people run from it just by hearing the word Kabbalah, thinking that it is witchcraft or something like that. And that is not the case. So I hope you stay for the teaching so that you see what I mean uh, by everything that I have said. This that you see right here is what they call, what is called the tree of life. The tree of life. And um, as we have seen before, you can see the name of Yahweh the name of Yahweh which is composed by four letters and it is read from right to left Yud, Hei, Vav, Hei and above it you can see the four levels of interpretation of scriptures the four levels in which Yahweh creates the four creatures around the throne of Yahweh the four Gospels um, where each represents and many other things <laughs> you can see it right there just like we have talked about these four levels many times and the many things that connect with it in this case with the tree of life as you can see it can be separated in four levels you can separate the tree of life in those same four levels the one above 
is um, well in these four levels it is a little bit how can I explain it okay basically the first level that you see there as you can see has a zero because that level doesn't count as one of the levels that I just showed you or the four levels if you were to divide the tree of life in four levels if we were if we were to divide the tree of life in four then you can do it with those lines that you see there it is divided in four but the first of those circles that you see in the tree of life those circles are called sefirot sefirot and are basically attributes that belong to the creator of all things to the father each one of those represents one of the titles or names that the Almighty uses to manifest and that we find in scriptures. If we start going from the top, the top is Keter, as you can see there, it means crown. It's Keter and it means crown. It represents the crown over the head, of course. This part, basically, as you can see, represents Adam Kadmon. Adam Kadmon is basically Yahushua the Messiah before he manifested on earth. Interestingly enough, scripture tells us that Yahushua is the last Adam. Adam. So, Yahushua is Adam. It is the, he is the Adam from whom the image was taken. To create the earthly Adam. So Adam Kadmon is basically the original man. As you can see, it can be translated as primordial, uh, primordial man. And in this area is basically when the specific will and plan of the Most High began to emanate to the worlds. Or, actually, after Yahweh decided, because of his will, to give manifestation to his plan, then the worlds began to emanate. The worlds below him, which would be the second heaven, in which there are many heavens, and where all the angels reside. To eventually make earth which is represented by the last sefirot but we're just in the beginning so the first sefirot is the crown or the first sefira sefirot is in plural so the first sefira is the crown called keter and is divided in two parts as we will see in just a little bit and you will see why we are seeing this in genesis just a second um or ein sof means the infinite light the light that comes from the eternal realm, that which is Messiah, who said, I am the light. So that's why it represents the zero. It is what existed before anything existed. And that's why also the word Ain in Hebrew is used. Ain means nothing. So it was before everything. That's what Keter represents. Then, Atzilut, as you can see on the right, Atzilut, which means emanation as we have seen it, is the first thing that emanated from Yahweh, or the nothingness as they call it. But I, wanna, I want you to understand when the word nothingness is used, it doesn't mean that the spiritual world, or that Yahweh, or that the third heaven is nothing. No, it is to understand that a thing is an object a thing is something created so the nothingness is what is eternal what existed before any thing material was created i hope that is clear and if not of, of course you can ask any questions you want through the chat so um the infinite light or 
the light of the infinite nothingness. That is where Adam Kadmon originated as the primordial men, from whom the image was taken when Elohim said, Let us make men in our image, that meant in Adam Kadmon's image. And that is why the first man on earth was called Adam. After Keter comes the Sephirah called Chokmah, which is wisdom. Wisdom, Chokmah. And that is the first emanation, the first level, em absolute emanation. As when you have an idea, it comes like a flash of light, just like Chokmah came out of the eternal realm. Then, after Hogma comes the second level, which is Beriya, creation, which is connected to Bina, which means understanding. So when you receive Hogma, when you receive wisdom to do something, when you receive an idea, then through the idea, you get to understand what you want to do. And that understanding brings the second level, which is creation. When you understand how to do what you want to do, then you are creating it already in your mind, which is the second level. You first get the idea, which is wisdom, and then you got to figure out how to do it, which is the understanding, creation. Those two levels, emanation and creation, Hogma and Bina, represent the two hemispheres of the brain. So Bina and Hogma represent the two hemispheres of the brain. And actually I should have done this a while ago, I'm sorry. Here you can see it a lot better, I think, <laughs> in case you couldn't read it before. Keter, the crown, as the crown over the head. On the right, Chogma, as the right uh, hemisphere of the brain. Is the right hemisphere of the brain the one that is connected to the spiritual world? That's why it is from it that we get the wisdom or that we get those flashes of light that are ideas that come straight from heaven. Just like we see it there. Then we use the left hemisphere of the brain to understand what we received from the spirit. So what we receive from the right hemisphere of the brain, we basically study what we just received. We think about it. We see the reasoning behind it or the how to bring it about or manifest it into this reality. And that is what brings understanding. Bina, the second level, which has to do with the left hemisphere of the brain. Basically, when you analyze the idea that you received as a flash of light. That is the second level. Then after that comes the third level, which would be Yetzirah. However, I wanted to also make this clear. What you are seeing on the screen right now, the first and second level, the zero basically is the spiritual world, which is connected to you, to us, through the right hemisphere of the brain. When we receive Chogma, wisdom. After that, we analyze th that wisdom that we receive to get understanding. All of that happens in the brain, in the mind, in the head. All of this has to do with the intellect, which is what a man represents. That's what Adam represents. That's why Adam is the head of the woman, and the woman is the body of the man. Each one representing or having a stronger connection to these attributes that we are seeing right now. So the third level is basically formed or composed by six sefirot. In the third level is the level that is connected to the emotions or that has to do with the emotions, with the imagination, which is what Eve or the woman represents. This is what is connected to the body, to the heart. So the first two levels that we just saw 
are connected to the two parts of the brain, are connected to the intellect. Now this six sefirot that we are seeing, they are all connected to emotions, to the heart. So just like the intellect is represented by Adam, the imagination is represented by Eve. Intellect and imagination. On the left, uh, well, first will come Chesed, which is favor. Chesed, all the Sefirot on the right, which is a pillar, as we will see eventually, represents the Messiah, Yahushua, the first coming. All the Sefirot on the left represent the second coming the last and at the end of times the first and the last will become one which is represented by the middle pillar we have chesed which is favor what we receive through the sacrifice of yahushua the messiah on the tree then after chesed comes gevura might yahweh said that in the second coming he would come as a giborim it's a gibor gibor comes from gevura which is basically might. He will come as a mighty one. And there are other translations that they give to this word. Just in case. Um, so, Chesed, then Gevura, then Tiferet, which is translated as splendor or beauty. It represents the balance between the right and the left. That's why it's beautiful, because beauty... Uh, Basically, when you see something that is symmetrical, it looks beautiful automatically because that's basically uh, how it works. So as you can see, Tiferet is basically the Sefirat that is in the middle of the whole tree. It represents the balance. It represents beauty. After that, it comes Netzach, which is eminence or some others translated also as victory, which is a word that I don't like to use that much because it re is related to a false deity. So I prefer to use triumph, for example. So Netzach is the triumph that Yahushua the Messiah had when he resurrected after being killed with no sin, giving us the favor so that we may receive the Chokmah, the wisdom of the Father. Then after Netzach come comes majesty, hot. Majesty is what Yahweh will give to the last because the last is coming as the Melech Gadol, the great king. So, the last that is represented by the left pillar will come just like Yahweh told Yahushua, sit at my right hand. That's why the right pillar represents Yahushua. The left pillar represents the second coming. And that's why Yahweh says that he holds the last by the right hand. If he's holding the last by the right hand, it's because the last will be on his left. So, when it comes to the left pillar, we see that the last one will come. And by receiving the Chogmah that Yahushua gives through his favor and triumph, he will get understanding. He will get Bina so that he can give it to the 144,000. After getting Bina, through the spirit of Yahushua, for we can do all things in him who strengthens us. Through his spirit, he's going to become mighty. And going to establish, he's going to establish the kingdom of Yahweh over this earth with Geburah. And by him establishing the kingdom on earth, then he, the majesty of the Most High will be clearly seen over all the earth. So, that is hot majesty. After that comes Yesod, which is the foundation. The foundation. It is connected with Yahusef. And obviously Yahushua is our foundation. Is the foundation of the temple. Being one, each one of the 144,000, one stone. So this six sefirot represent, represent the emotions. And they represent the third level, which is Yetzira, formation. Through the emotions, well, first, either the, the either emotions can get to control you or you can get to control the emotions. 
Either way, through them, you will receive form, <laughs> basically. When you mature, it is because you were able to control your emotions. So you receive a different form than when you were immature. And I'm talking mentally, emotionally. So that's why formation has to do with this part. Also, it is through the emotions and through imagination that we get to set in order what we just uh, planned and thought about in the first two levels. I hope that is clear. So first we get the idea, Hogma. Then we understand how to put it to work, Bina. Then we put it in order, Yetzira, using emotions, using imagination. In what are we going to need might? For what are we going to need favor? How can we get balance? What will the foundation be? How can we triumph in what we want to accomplish? And how can the majesty of the Most High be reflected through it, for instance? So those are the first three levels. After that comes the fourth and last level of creation. And as you know, the fourth level of creation is called Asiya, which means action. Asiya is action, is basically when we put everything that we thought about and plan, we put it in action, where we can actually see it, manifest it. And that is why this fourth level is only one sefirah, because it's basically the end of what the crown thought about. Basically, from the crown came the idea of creating a kingdom. This last sefirah is the manifestation of that kingdom. This last sefirah is connected to earth. That is why the kingdom of Yahweh will be established on earth. And that's why this sefirah is called Malkut. Malkut is kingdom. So the first sefirah is crown. The last sefirah is kingdom. Basically like the first and the last. Through the first we get a crown. Through the last, the kingdom will manifest. So those are the four levels. Those are the ten sefirot. There are different ways to, to draw the tree of life. As a matter of fact, I actually um, made a, a new tree. I'm pretty sure Judaism will reject it. <laughs> but um, eventually, the more we see about this subject, the more I will... Uh, show what I have been doing in, in this um, area of knowledge. So that is the tree. Right now, if you see the top, the top of the tree, we have Keter. This is Keter right here. And as you can see, this is a simple one. It, I found interesting that when you cut that part of the tree, you basically get a cross. You get a cross with a crown on top of it. The crown, because remember the name of, the, of this sefirah, which is the first, is called keter, means crown. Each sefirah has two parts, just like everything in this world was separated in two. Each sefirah has two parts, one that receives one that gives one receives from a previous sefirah one gives to the next sefirah just like a man gives and a female receives so each sefirah is like an angel in the sense that is androgynous <laughs> has a part that receives and a part that gives has a um has two parts just like a coin two faces um in this case, since this is the first sefirah in the tree, uh, one or some would say maybe that the sefirah is not receiving anything. We got to understand that basically this sefirah is connected to a higher tree. As we will see eventually, um, each tree can be connected to a lower tree and it can keep going. 
indefinitely just like it can be seen going up in that sense if we were to see this tree as the first of all trees then the higher part of this sephira which is the one that receives would be receiving straight from Yahweh straight from the Ruach HaKodesh of Yahweh because this sephira would be basically as we see here it is separated in two parts Atik Yomim and Arihan Pim. Atik Yomim is basically the, the ancient of days. The ancient of days. Meaning the one that has existed during all time. Ever since time was created, he had been there even before that. So all the days of time he has existed therefore he is the ancient of days yomim having to do with days adihan pim is that a make and it means long face long face or extended countenance implying the infinitely patient one this represents the last that's why the long face. <laughs> um, Atik Yomim is the first part. Therefore, it represents the first manifestation of Yahweh on earth. Yahushua the Messiah. The Word. The second part, which is the one that gives. Because it's the one that is going to give the recompense to the 144,000. The reward to those that are awaiting Yahweh. And the promise that He gave us through His Son, Yahushua. So just as Yahushua uh, received from the Father the promise, he received from the Father the power, the life, everything. Now he passes it to the second coming, which is represented by Ari Hampin, and who represents, as we see in scriptures, the face of Yahweh. The last one will be the face that people will see on earth when they had to come when they want to come before Yahweh, they will see the face of the last. Because the world did not want to see Yahushua. So they will have to see the last. That's why the last is represented by Ari Hanpin. Which, like I said, they translate it as long face or extended countenance. And the infinitely patient one, which is interesting because the patience is related to the end times. Because he has been patient with those that are in sin so that they may repent and come to the truth. So, the patient one has to do with the last days. The face has to do with the last manifestation of Yahweh also. So, Atik Yomim, the Ancient of Days, is the first, Yahushua, the Word. Ain, a word can be just written. You don't have to hear or say a word. A word can just exist in your mind or, like I said, in a paper. Like, it represents the first half of this sefirah called Ain, nothingness. Nothingness. Yahushua is the Word. Then it comes Ani, which means I am. And that has to do with the second coming. Because Yahweh will manifest as the witness like Moshe. And like I said, will be the representation of Yahweh on earth. That's why Ani. Ain, Ani. Atik Yomim, Arihan Pim. The first and the last. The word and the voice. Those two manifestations of Yahweh on earth are in the first sefirah called crown. I hope that's clear. This is this sefirah represents when Yahweh decided to create, the first step was to separate himself in two manifestations. After that came Hogma, Bina, etc. etc. Like I said, it is interesting that when we look at this, we can see that 
there is a cross that is formed. And interestingly enough, the sefirah is called crown, like the crown of thorns that they put over Yahushua's head when they decided to kill him. So isn't that interesting? The crown that was over his head and the cross that is formed by sefirah passing its energy to the other sefirah or in this case sefirot to form all these lines. So Keter is the crown representing the crown of thorns that was put on the head of Messiah Yahushua. It is interesting that on the cross Pilate wrote something which the Jews did not like but Pilate wrote this because it was the will of the Most High and because Pilate recognized that Yahushua was indeed who he was claiming to be but he listened to the people and put him on the cross right here we see from right to left in Hebrew it reads Yahushua Hanatsri Hanotri Bemelech Hayahudim, which means Yahushua, the Nazarene, meaning Hebrew is a little bit different, but basically the way that it will be translated nowadays, it will be Yahushua of Nazareth and King of the Yahudim. In Hebrew, Yahushua Hanotri Bemelech Hayahudim. I repeat, Yahushua of Nazareth and king of the Yahudim. As you can see in Hebrew, this is written using four words. Four words. The first, Yahushua, starts with a Yud. Yahushua starts with a Yud. Then, Hanotri starts with a Hey. Then, Bemelech, and king, starts with a Vav. Then, Hayahudim, starts with a He. So, Yahweh, by doing this through Pilate, he created an anagram. I mean, an acronym. He created an acronym. By uniting each of the first letters of these four words we get the name of the Most High we get the name Yahweh as you can see Yud Hey Vav Hey we get the name of the Most High Yahweh so the Almighty by making Pilate write that on the cross he was telling everybody who they were hanging they were hanging Yahweh, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. So, that, like I said, it was interesting how the cross is formed and, and what the crown represents, like we just saw. In the book of The book written by Shlomo in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 18 it says for in much wisdom is much grief and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow why did I put this here because like I was saying the right part Hogma is wisdom. And it represents the first coming. Here Yahweh is saying, For in much wisdom is much grief. Yahushua came as the manifestation of wisdom. And they killed him. He went through grief. Because he was wisdom incarnate. 
Then it says, And he who increases knowledge, meaning the second coming, as the tree of knowledge of good, meaning the tree of knowledge of the Father, just like Yahushua became the tree of life. Here in the middle of the cross where you see the letters, the Hebrew letters, in the middle of the cross, that is where normally they put another sefirah, or where another sefirah goes, but it is invisible, because it represents the sefirah of knowledge, that, the sefirah of knowledge, as you can see it actually right here. The sefirah of knowledge, that, um, is right in the middle. They don't, they don't normally draw it because it represents the fact that Adam and Eve ate the fruit of knowledge. That's why the fruit of knowledge, the sefirah of knowledge, is not present. Also remember, like I said, this is called the tree of life. That's why it doesn't have knowledge in it. But since in Judaism they teach that the tree of life and the tree of knowledge had the same root, then basically in the tree of life, knowledge is hidden. Just like the first is hidden in the last and the last is hidden in the first. So in the tree of life, the sefirah of knowledge is hidden. And that's where it goes. Basically where Messiah was hanging. It was the knowledge of the Father hanging from the tree. That's why you can see Yahweh, which like I said, the, ac the acronym that is formed by uniting the four letters that Pilate wrote in the beginning of, of each of the four words that he wrote on the tree. So you get Yahweh, blood coming down, so that through his sacrifice, we would get the knowledge of the Father, which is amazing. Because like Ecclesiastes says, he says, For in much wisdom is much grief. Yahushua came as wisdom and had to die, went through grief. Then the second coming, and he who increases knowledge, look how it says increases. Meaning that Messiah already came to give knowledge. Now the last one will increase that knowledge that the first gave. So the last one comes, he increases knowledge, and therefore also will be sacrificed. So we see all of this in the tree of knowledge. I mean the tree of life. And we see that knowledge is hidden in the tree of life. You can see it as hidden, or you can see it as the fact that Adam and Eve ate from it, so the fruit is not there anymore. However, like I said, when Yahushua was hanging from the tree, he became the fruit of the knowledge of the Father. After this, uh, there's, well, just, just like, five more images that I want to see and you are about to see why I came up with all this I wanted to see this that have to do with the Messiah because I think they're very interesting we're about to get with Genesis which is the study of uh, tonight here we see once again the same parts of the tree and I just want to show a, a couple things in this image as you can see on the top, Matthew 22, 37 to 38, it is connected with the first part called Atik Yomim, the inner part, the first, Ain, Yahushua. It says, Yahushua said to him, You shall love Yahweh, your mighty one, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is the first and great commandment. So the first and great commandment is connected with the first or inner part of the Sefirah called Keter. Then he continued, and the second is like it. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, on these two commandments, hang all the law, 
meaning the Torah, and the prophets, the Navim, meaning the entire Tanakh. So the entire Tanakh, what they call the Old Testament, they, the whole thing hangs from two commandments. And those two commandments represent the Sefirah of Keter. The Sefirah of Keter has the inner and the outer part, first and last, representing the first and second commandment from which all the Tanakh hangs. Just like I said, Yahushua was hanging from the tree, the tree represented by this tree of life, which happens to have a cross in the middle, which represents the fulfillment of the whole Torah, which Yahushua fulfilled and hang on that tree. That's why the whole Torah is hanging from these two commandments. So, Yahushua himself said it, this is the first, and then he said, and the second is like it. The second is like it. Just like the first and the last are one. The second is like the first. Meaning the second and first manifestation of Yahweh on earth. So when we go to the right, we go to Hogmah, wisdom, which represents the first. When we go to the left, represents the second coming of Yahweh, the second pillar, which goes to Bina, understanding. When we go straight down, straight down, um, well, I'm going to move the image a little bit so you can see the rest. When you go straight down, you can see the separation of the Old and the New Testament, basically. Before and after Messiah. To the right, we have the positive. To the left, we have the negative. Not that the last one is negative, but the last one comes to judge, to condemn the evil, the unrighteous. So obviously for them, it will be negative. Yahushua came to bring the favor. To bring life that is positive so the right side represents the positive the left the negative in the middle the balance of both the union just like fire and water form the heavens that's why shamaim is made up of esh and maim fire and water yahushua is the water of life which gives life of course and the last is the fire, the consuming fire, which tests the hearts of the people and many other things. The fire can burn, and that is negative. So, right and left, positive and negative. Leviticus, 18, uh, Leviticus 19, 18, it says, you shall, not, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall, see how it says you shall not, and then it says you shall, like negative and positive. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. So as you can see, the commandment which Yahushua said that the whole Torah is hanging of, well, he said both, uh, two commandments, but he said that they were alike. Because to fulfill one, you need the other. So... As you can see, the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself was already in the book of Leviticus. It was already in the Torah. It is not like Yahushua came to reveal something new. For some reason, people did not practice it. And they still don't. So we said Leviticus 19.18 showing the right and the left. In this case, the left and the right, the negative and the positive. Given a negative commandment and then given a positive commandment. Meaning... Because remember that there are 613 commandments in the Tanakh. 613 commandments in the Tanakh. Of which 248 are positive. 248 are positive connected to the name Abraham. Who fulfill all those. And 365 are negative. So 248 positive. 365 negative, we add it, we get 613 commandments in the Tanakh. But all of those 613 commandments hang from two commandments. Love Yahweh with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, which was already given in Leviticus 19.18, where it says, You shall not 
Negative commandment. Take vengeance. The negative. Yahweh, through the last, will fulfill his vengeance on the nations. The negative part on the left. Nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall, positive commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Just like Yahushua came and he loved us so much that he died for us. And then he says, I am Yahweh. Ani Yahweh. I put, just like you see, negative and positive, last and first, all and new. All and new. Like I have said before, the last will come to give knowledge of the Father through the revelation of truth that Yahushua gave. So we see here in the Sefirah that is hidden because Yahweh would come as a thief in the night, hidden in a cloud, etc. So the Sefirah of knowledge is hidden. The knowledge of the Father is hidden within the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of truth that we receive in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, according to John 14, 26. So, the last is the outer part. Remember, the first is the inner. That's why the first is in heaven, in the right hand of the Father. We cannot see Him, just like He said. Only the, ch the chosen few will see Him. The rest of the world will not see Him ever, ever, ever again. The world will not see Him. Only the chosen few who will be able to access heaven. The rest of people who will be justified and will enter the kingdom as the people will not be allowed to enter heaven. Only earth. Only the, the earthly kingdom. So the inner is that which is in heaven. Yahushua the first. The outer is that which will be on earth. The last one. So the last is the outer is the Hanavi, the prophet. In 1st of John 3.23, it says, And this is His commandment. This is His commandment. This is very important. 1st of John 3.23 was written after Yahushua the Messiah had died, resurrected, and gone up to be hidden within the Father. So as we saw Yahushua in Matthew, when He was on earth, He told uh, the person who asked him, well, he basically told us, what are the two commandments? The main two commandments. But after he died and resurrected on the cross, like we just saw on the previous image, after that, those two commandments became one commandment. Those two commandments were able to, um, well, well, became one so that we were able to understand or fulfill the whole Torah through just one commandment which is and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Yahushua HaMashiach and love one another as he gave us commandment we, if we have Yahushua we have Yahweh if we have Yahushua and recognize him as our Messiah sovereign and Savior then we receive the spirit of Yahweh. Yahweh is love. Therefore, when we receive the spirit of love, we can begin loving our neighbor like ourselves. Not before that. So to fulfill the second part, you need the first. So that's why I said both, both commandments that Yahushua mentioned, once he died and resurrected, were united in one that will be given by the last, the Hanavi, well, the Navi, the prophet. And that commandment is, believe in the name of the Son, Yahushua HaMashiach. He is the way, He is the door to the Father. So, we saw two commandments, they unite as one to the last one, meaning the second coming. And as you can see, the lines that are coming down, one is coming from Hogma, one is coming from Bina. And one is coming from the middle. Yahushua said, from these two commandments, which were represented by the two parts of Keter, in those two, command, uh, two commandments hang the whole Torah, the whole Tanakh, 
because he said the Torah and the prophets. So the whole Tanakh. The Tanakh is composed by the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketuvim. That's why it's called Tanakh. La, <laughs> the, the letter Tav for Torah, the letter um, Nun for Navim, and the, ne the letter Kaf for Ketuvim. So by uniting those three letters as an acronym, we get Tanakh. That is what they call in Hebrew the Old Testament. What people call the Old Testament in English, but in Judaism they call it Tanakh. So, one Sefira, from which all the attributes, the rest of the nine attributes come. And from that Sefira, the two commandments, from which all the Tanakh hangs. If we take from that sefirah the line that is straight, we get the Torah, the fulfillment of the Torah, the understanding of the Torah, which is straight, like the law, like justice, straight. And it's the first revelation that Yahweh gave. It's the first revelation that he prepared because through it, he created earth and heavens and everything in it. So the Torah is represented by the line in the middle. The Navim or the Prophets is represented by what is coming from Hogma because the Prophets receive from the Spirit like a flash of light the prophecy that they reveal either in a vision or in words. So the Navim come from the Spirit of Hogma, which comes from the right. And the Ketuvim are the writings like the Psalms written by David who actually represents the second coming. So Ketuvim like uh, Proverbs like chronicles kings and other writings so here we see the fulfillment of the torah the the whole tanakh and how the tanakh is represented or was revealed through the tree of life that was um just like an intro regarding the tree and to show why i have studied this information of kabbalah because it it confirms that Yahushua is the Messiah. Now, when it comes to creation, as we saw in the previous chapters of scriptures, the Yahweh created everything in seven days as we know he well he created in six days but then on the seventh he rested and the seventh is still counted because he created rest on the seventh he created rest for humans who would need it <laughs> um so he created earth on seven days that's why the seven is the representation of the um, completeness in the material world seven is completeness in the material world however the number 10 is completeness in the spiritual world or the heavenly it is perfection the number 10 and the way you can see it is the number seven which is earth plus yahweh mashiach and the spirit we get 10 heavenly perfection, heavenly uh, fulfillment, or fullness. So, um, the seven is earthly, the ten is heavenly. Both represent completeness. And that has to do with the fact that Yahweh when he made creation like i said he did it in when it comes to time seven days time has to do with the lower dimension with this reality therefore the seven has to do with the lower reality and when he created during those seven days he did it through the word through ten sayings that's why the seven and the ten are connected in creation seven days the time in which he created everything in space and 
during those seven days, what he create what he created, he did it through ten sayings. As we saw, the tree of life has ten sefirot. Each one of those sefirot is connected with one of those ten sayings through which Yahweh created everything. So the tree of life, just like we saw, Yahweh creates in four levels. Those four levels can be separated in sefirot. Like we saw the tree of life being separated in four levels. So since creation is separated in four, and those four levels can be separated a little bit more within the tree of life, then we can also think of creation as the tree of life. And in that case, when we do it like that, we can see each of the things that Yahweh said to create, how each one of those connects which one of those attributes or sefirot that we just saw. In that case, here we have, uh, and I'm going to show two because there are two different interpretations or representations of the tree of life. In this case, This is the, the tree created by Luria. And it's a little bit different than the one created by Cordovero. And I made two versions based on each of those. So we're gonna see we're gonna see them in just a second. Um, this one gonna make it closer so that you can see it better at least the, the top of it well in this one this one has to do with creation a stole in Genesis 1 which we already read according to the Lurianic tree like I said is of Luria uh, as they would call him in Judaism one of the um, teachers of Judaism, wise men of the past. When it comes to this tree, like I said, was created by Itzak Luria, Itzak Luria, Ben Shlomo or Ben Salomon. He was an Ashkenazi. We know, as you know, I don't agree. I mean, I don't like much what Ashkenazis believe or follow for many reasons because they are not descendants of Israel. But one thing that is true is that they did take from Israel many of the knowledge or the teachings that Israelim would receive and give. And they kept it. So that's why now, unfortunately, uh, at some points we are getting some knowledge from them. <laughs> Basically, we're taking it back. Because now we are interpreting it the way it should have been interpreted all along, according to Yahushua Hamashiach, the Messiah who they rejected and killed. So here we have it, and like well, you can see this one is a little bit different than the one we saw before, because the one we saw before was based on the drawing of Cordovero. That's what they call the, the, the type of tree. In this case, um, yeah, uh, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who, if I'm not mistaken, was a Sephardi. Therefore, quite possibly, was indeed a descendant. But still, does not did not believe in the Messiah, and therefore... Um, we do not agree with everything that he said. Like I said, Keter has two parts, or as it's called in, in normally in the Kabbalah, two parts of him. An inner and an outer called Atik Yomim and Arik Hanpim. As two faces, like I have said, yeah, the first and the last are like two faces of the same coin, two parts of the same coin. In... Here I have an image which I think 
well, most of you have seen already. Here are some of the things that connect with the first and the last. The first and the last are represented by the Hebrew letters Aleph and Taf, first and last letters of the Aleph Bet, the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph and Taf are the letters that are on top. And what you see under those letters is what each of those represent. The first and the last are water of life consuming fire, the temple and the ark, the word and the voice, the door and the good shepherd, the arm and the hen, the root and the branch, the Mashiach and the Navi, Mashiach ben Yehuda, Mashiach ben Yahusef, the sword and the bow, Kohen Gadol, Melech Gadol, and the two pillars of the temple, Yachin and Boaz. This is just a few of the titles or the representations of the first and the last as given in scriptures. The first came to bring mercy, the second came to bring justice, is coming to bring justice. Yahushua the first is the literal seed of the woman because he was born of a virgin. So literally, he fulfilled that prophecy of the seed of the woman. However, the last fulfills that prophecy spiritually because he is the seed, spiritual seed of the congregation of the chosen few. So the congregation represents the woman that is in a battle against the serpent because Yahweh put enmity between the serpent, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. So Yahushua was literally born of a virgin. The last one is spiritually born of the congregation of the chosen few, which is like a virgin. In a spiritual sense, Yahushua was the son of man because he did not come from a man. Joseph was his spiritual father, like a stepfather. But in a literal way, the last one will be the son of man. So that's why what in the new covenant is prophesied spiritually regarding Messiah, in the when it comes to the second or the last one, is prophesied literal, as you can see in the image. I repeat, if you read the New Covenant, what you see prophesied in a spiritual way regarding the last, it will be interpreted in a literal way regarding the first. And what you see in the, old, in the New Covenant fulfilled in a literal way is in a spiritual way with the other. Basically, uh, like I always say, what is fulfilled with one in a spiritual way is fulfilled in a physical way with the other. The feast that the first fulfilled was Pesach, Matzot, Bikurim, and Shavuot, the Moedim that are first in the list, and start in the month of Abib, which is the first month, according to what Yahweh told us after the Exodus. And in Eitanim is the seventh month, which is about to be fulfilled through the last, through the two witnesses. And the Moedim are Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Shemini Atzeret. This is a very important image because I think it teaches a lot. Uh, just with uh, everything that you see there. But the reason why I was showing it is because these are the two phases, the two phases that we are seeing in that sefirah of Keter. Atik Yomim and Arik Ampim as two phases. The Ain and the Ani, the nothingness and the I. The nothingness and the I. That or knowledge is the outer part of Keter, which is very important. Like we saw in the previous one, but I didn't explain it like this. This is very interesting. That knowledge is the outer part of Keter. So that is a confirmation of what I was saying. The last one is the one that comes to give knowledge, increase knowledge through the truth that Yahushua revealed as Chogmah. So the outer part of Keter which is called Arihan Pim, is basically that. I repeat that. That is the outer part of Keter and the inner of Tiferet. So each part of the tree of life is connected with another one directly. In this case, the outer part of Keter is directly connected to the At. And with the inner part of Tiferet, which remember I said, Tiferet represents the balance between the right and the left when the first and the last will become one. So in that case, in Tiferet, the last one is the inner part. 
Therefore, that remains revealed in Keter. So, since that you don't see it because Adam and Eve ate from it, and the knowledge of the Father is hidden within those who believe in Messiah, then that is actually when you cannot see it, is because it's hidden within Keter. And it remains revealed within Keter. So, if you reach Keter, you will receive the knowledge that is hidden. In there. There are two parts to each of the Sefirah. When it comes to the Keter, which is, like I have said, when you connect a tree to another tree, it is connected Malkut with Keter, meaning the last of one tree to the first Sefirah of the next tree. In this case, in the inner part of Keter, basically is where the words Bereshit bara Elohim in the beginning, Elohim created. In the beginning, Elohim created. Which is already part of the Torah. It's part of the Torah, but it's just... Uh, remember the first, the first four letters? The uh, first words, I mean, first four words, which are connected with the four letters of the name of Yahweh and the four levels of creation. And in, it is not Yahweh speaking yet. In the beginning, Elohim created. It is the inner part, and as we know, the inner part is the word, Yahushua. So through the word, this was said in the beginning, Elohim created. The outer part is, give you every green herb for food. This may be a little bit weird right now, but this is because that is basically the end of, what every, of everything that Yahweh said. In Judaism, normally they count in the beginning Elohim created as a saying, even though itself doesn't say, and he said in the beginning. But like I have said before, it is understood that before Yahweh created everything, he wrote the Torah and then he read the Torah. So basically, Elo, uh, in the beginning Elohim created was something that came out through Yahweh, which being that the word of Yahweh, Yahushua. Therefore, they count it as the first saying, even though it doesn't say Elohim said. But why, why it doesn't say Elohim said? Because it is the first sefirah, which is part of the nothingness. Therefore, Yahweh did not say anything before it. I hope that is clear. Since that is the portion of the tree that represents nothingness, the zero level, eternity, the eternal realm. That is the reason why there is not a an Elohim said previous to it. It just starts in the beginning, Elohim created. Then, if we go to the right, we, say, we see that he said, let there be light. As we see in scriptures, and Elohim said, let there be light. Hogmah. When we receive wisdom, is like getting light. That's why in, in cartoons they draw, when, when somebody gets an idea, a light bulb on top of his head. So let there be light. Light is connected to wisdom. Yahushua is wisdom incarnate, like I already said. Hogma. It is written that Yahweh created all things through wisdom. And it is also written that he made everything through the word. The word of wisdom, basically. And that is basically like two parts. The word is like the male part. The wisdom is like the female part. But they are one in the higher dimension. Just in case you hear something about that eventually. So let there be light connected with Hogma Through the spirit, which is the hay. And when it comes to the 12, the 12 signs of the zodiac, which as we know, uh, maybe not all, but in the, in the stars, Yahweh wrote destiny. The destiny for, his, for human history, for this creation. Each of those signs represent one of the prophecies that Yahweh would fulfill through the first and the last, through the congregation, and even what um, Satan represents and everything. In this case, uh, you can see... 
the symbol is that of the lamb. When it comes to the zodiac signs, in the horoscope as they call it, is Aries. So uh, Aries represents the lamb. In this that I am showing you, you can, like I, like I said, it, you can confirm it. Obviously not the things that have to do with the Messiah, Yahushua. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the signs of the Zodiac, where they go and everything, you can confirm it if you study a little bit of it. So it is interesting that we see Aries and the letter H as the bridge for the light to be manifested as the bridge for Chokmah. So let there be light came through the spirit, which is represented by the letter He. Chokmah is that spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. And through the Lamb, which is the first, Yahushua. That zodiac sign. So, you can see that that bridge from Keter to Chokmah represents the spirit moving upon the waters, like we read in Genesis 1. The spirit was moving upon the waters when, after Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So you see, basically in this tree, you can see the whole chapter 1 explained in the order in which it came to be, in which everything came to be. Just like there are 10 sefirot, there are 32 paths of wisdom. 32 paths of wisdom, meaning 32 bridges that connect each sefirah to another one. So 32 paths of wisdom. Um, the, just a second. There are 10 sefirot which are connected with the 10 Elohim said. In scriptures when it says Elohim said, let there be light. Elohim said, uh, let there be a firmament. Elohim said, there are 10 Elohim sets, which are also connected to 10 commandments. There are 22 times in which the title Elohim appears. 22 times, like the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet. 22 letters that Yahweh used in his alphabet, in his alphabet, to create everything. And he used the name Elohim 22 times in the first chapter, meaning each letter connecting to one time that Yahweh used the title Elohim. So 22 Elohims, just like letters in the alphabet. And there are 22 paths. So just a second. There are... 32 paths of wisdom. Oh yeah, my bad. I said 32 paths of wisdom in total. In total. Because you connect the bridges or the paths with the sefirot. There are 22 paths. Each has a letter of the alphabet connected to it. And there are 10 sefirot. Each one has one of the commandments and one of the sayings of Yahweh during creation connected to it. So the 10 sefirot plus the 22 paths we get the 32 paths of wisdom. So I repeat, 22 bridges, including or adding the 10 sefirot, we get 32. And that's why for each of the bridges or paths, there is one letter of the Aleph Bet connecting one to the other. There are, of those paths, of those bridges, there are three that are horizontal. Three which represent the patriarchs meaning Abraham, Isaac and Jacob it also represents the father, the spirit and the son each of those levels as you can see on the right there are three sefirot on the left there are three sefirot each of those are connected by one horizontal line that the one on the top represents the father the one in the middle the spirit the one on the bottom the son which is separated in right and left it also represents Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob. And it also represents um, 
uh, water, fire, and earth. There are seven days, of course, in which Yahweh created everything. He did it in seven days. Just like there were seven children by Leah. If we include Dina. Just like there are seven heavenly bodies. Right? Uh, Saturn, Jupiter, uh, Mars, Mercury, uh, the moon, the sun, and Venus. Seven children by Leah, seven heavenly bodies, which are in the vertical bridges or vertical paths or lines that connect Sephirot. There are seven of those. And then there are 12 diagonal lines connecting Sephirot. 12 connected to the 12 apostles, to the 12 tribes, and to the 12 constellations or zodiac signs. The 10 Elohim said are written in, in yellow. The three in which Elohim did not, uh, well, it doesn't say Elohim uh, said, but it says Elohim made. Remember that there are 22 Elohim. 10 is when Elohim said. 3, when Elohim made. Just like he made the three patriarchs. And 7, Elohim saw. Therefore, he saw everything. He saw creation completed. That's why Elohim saw appears 7 times. The 3 represents stability. That's why Elohim made appears three times. So what he made was stable. What he saw was complete. What he said was perfect. Three, seven, and ten, as I just said it. And then, twelve Elohim connected to another word. Ten Elohim said, three Elohim made, seven Elohim saw, twelve Elohim, the title by itself. Like the 12 apostles, once again. The 10 Elohim said are in the 10 Sephirot. The three mothers is what uh, the um, three mothers, meaning the letters, they, they are called mothers, are in the horizontal paths. Respectively, the Shin, the Aleph, and the Mem. It's interesting that the Mem is the one in the last horizontal bridge. And like I said, that represents the Sun. The Sun is Messiah, Mashiach, which, which starts with the Mem, with the letter Mem. Yahweh is a consuming fire, which is represented by the Shin. And the Spirit is what Yahweh uses to connect heaven and earth, which is represented by the Aleph. The seven double vertical paths, that's what they are called. The three horizontals are mothers. The seven vertical paths are doubles, as you can see, because um, there are two of them on each side. <laughs> and then one in the middle. I mean, one, two, three, four in the middle. So, seven double vertical paths, represented by the Beth, Gimel. Dalet, Kaf, Peh, Resh, and Taf. And the 12 elementals having to do with diagonal paths and the letters are the He, the Vav, Sain, Chet, Tet, Yud, Lamet, Nun, Samech, Ain, Sade, and Kuf. So after let there be light, Yahweh said let there be a firmament. After he said, let there be a firmament, he said, gather the waters. After he said, gather the waters, he said that green herbs should be created. Then the lights. Then sea and flying creatures. Then beasts of the earth. Then men. <laughs> so when we see hay and Aries go to the right to bring the light. Then, to the left, we have the Vav, 
which is connected to a man. It represents a man. Like the second comes as the son of man. And it is when Elohim created heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, Elohim created heavens and the earth. And the spirit was moving upon the waters. And the created the heavens and the earth. I put it to the left because it is in the heavens that or even that is the word that Yahweh used to call the firmament that he created on the second day. As you can see, uh, so the He and the Vav as the spirit and the son of men. The spirit moving upon the waters and creating the heavens and the earth. And the son of man is the first and last heaven and earth. We see the letter B light connected to the firmament by the shin, which is a letter that represents Esh. And light comes from uh, fire, just like the firmament was formed by the mix of water and fire. So the, the shin is there for many reasons, of course. Then after that, and I mean, there's so many things to say, but I'm going to try and keep it short. He called the firmament heaven. From let there be light, it says. He separated light from darkness. When he made light, then he separated light from darkness. When he made the firmament, then he called the firmament heaven. Kuf, which is the letter that you see there in the diagonal, represents, is the only letter that goes down the line. So, it represents the Almighty descending from heaven. And the heaven is the name that was given to the firmament. So the Kuf being there is perfect. Then we have the Sain, which is a sword. A sword is, huge, is used to separate. Just like Yahweh separated the light from the darkness. Like using a sword. And what is the sword? The word of Yahweh. And who is the word of Yahweh? Yahushua the Messiah. And what is Yahushua? The light. So let there be light. And then he separated the light by using the sword. And when he separated the light, look how Gemini, uh, Gemini is the symbol that is in that line. Gemini, like when you separate the manifestation of the first and the last in two, like Gemini. Then we have... Uh, the other line that gets out of let there be light call he called the light day in the darkness he called night after he separated he gave a name to it Leo meaning the lion is the symbol or the sign for this diagonal line and as you can see or as you know may know Leo represents the lion of Yahuda. The Lion of Yahuda is he who came through the tribe of Yahuda, Mashiach Yahushua, who is the light. So that's why we see those symbols coming from it. Yahushua is the temple. That's why also the line, the, the vertical line from let there be light is connected to the Bet, which represents the temple. Then the sign is that of a planet, Mercury. Mercury represents a messenger. Yahushua came as a messenger to give us the light, the spirit, the wisdom of the Father. And it's connected to land and sea. Land and sea that Yahweh created. The land and the sea. Just like the land became the house for beasts and men. And the sea became the house for sea creatures. <laughs> Therefore, land and sea connected to the bed, which is the temple. On the other side, we have the firmament, which is connected to the green herbs or the next um, sephirah under it. It's connected by the green herbs that Yahweh created. Um, the gimel is the letter that connects the firmament to the green herbs. And the gimel represents movement, as when the green herbs grow. The moon is right there, just like the moon was set in the firmament. Then we see, well, from up down, he called the firmament heaven, represented by the Kuf. Then set the light on the firmament. Set the light on the firmament. What light? The sun. 
and interestingly enough that diagonal line is connected to the lights when he created the lights the sun and the moon interestingly enough this sephira represents the sun itself Uh, the line that goes straight, vertical, straight from Keter to Tiferet, which is where you see lights, is a Dalet, the letter Dalet, which is a door. Like Keter, the king is going through a door, being that door the sun. So what is going through the sun is the light, that is Yahweh. And that's why you see here the light in the bridge or the path. Here, you see, when he said, let there be green herbs, let the uh, waters gather. After that, we have sea and flying creatures and beasts of the earth. Sea and flying creatures on the right. And as you can see, the line that is coming vertically from Hogma represents land and the sea and then sea and flying creatures basically the path is the creation is the time in which they were being created and the sefira is when they were fully created when they were done that's what the sefira represents and that's why at times you can see that it repeats it like green herbs green herbs sea and flying creatures sea and flying creatures also because of the way that it is written in the torah so if you were to read Chapter 1, again, following this tree, you will find many other things that I will not mention because of lack of time. Um, the green herbs are connected to the lights. As we know, the green herbs need light to grow. Uh, he gathered the waters, beast of the earth, sea and flying creatures. Everything is connected to the lights and then all of those go to men. As men being the center, the foundation. That's why men, when Elohim said, let us create men in our image and likeness. This happened as the foundation of creation. Men being that foundation. And that's why Yahushua came as the last Adam, the last men, to be the foundation of the congregation. The first stone of the temple. So that's why men is the foundation and that's why sea and flying creatures beasts of the earth need to honor men or were put under the authority of men and men receives the light straight from the father and authority over the sea and the land over the creatures of the sea and the earth and Yahweh gave us green herbs to eat. So all of it comes to men. As we see in the diagonal lines that we see around lights. Created the great sea creatures. After the green herbs created the, sea, the great sea creatures. And you can see the symbol of the zodiac which is connected here to this diagonal line. Is... Um, the one having to do with water. That's why he created this great sea creatures. Then we see he created man in his own image. He created man in his own image. Then we see called the dry land earth and the waters he called seas. And he blessed the creatures that he created. I'm just reading uh, the bridges. There are around lights. The separation of light from darkness was done when the lights were created. And as you can see, that middle bridge, vertical bridge from the top to the bottom, after lights, has the symbol of the sun. So you can see how everything comes together perfectly. Everything that each letter represents, everything that each zodiac sign represents, and each thing that was created through the word of Yahweh that we see within the Sefirot. And then, at last, in this tree, at least, 
after men, we see that Yahweh blessed them. Yahweh blessed them. So, the whole creation begot, began with, in the beginning, Elohim created. And it finished with a blessing. So, when Yahweh created everything, then He blessed it. And in this case, He blessed men and told them to be fruitful. And after blessing men, He told them, give you, I give you every green herb for food. That's why I put as the outer of Keter, Keter that last saying. Because if we are going to take the ten sayings and count the inner Keter, then we have to include in the beginning Elohim created. But if we are going to count only the times that He is actually saying, like Elohim said, then I added give you every green herb for food, because that's what He said after creating everything, but He did say it to men. So that's why I put it as the outer. Also, to understand that it would be then, if you were to connect another tree to it, then it would be the part that would be connecting with the next tree. Then everything that he created was created for men. That's why everything ends up connected to the creation of men. The letter that you see above men is the Raish, meaning that men is the head of this creation. The authority. The Lamet is what comes from the left as men was supposed to be the shepherd of the beast of the earth. Lamet represents a shepherd, represents a staff as the authority that was given to men over the beast of the earth. The Nun represents humbleness. Uh, just like the sea can make a person humble when he sees all that greatness and um, how vast the the oceans are and the creatures that are in it but it also represents a seed like man has a seed to give to the woman and man is basically like the seed that Yahweh wanted to put in this creation to uh, bring humanity 6,000 years later to judgment meaning that he put a seed through Adam and then 7.5 billion people are on earth Awaiting judgment. <laughs> so he blessed them, connected to the right, when he blessed the sea and flying creatures. And he, and he created man in his own image. He created him. Man. After man comes action. Comes Malkut, the kingdom. It is connected through the path, which has to do with the letter Taf, which is the last letter. Meaning that the last men that will come will finish creation in the last days. And Yahweh saw everything that he made. After he made men, he saw everything that he made at the end, like the taf. And he blessed it. He blessed men and women. So there we see the first chapter of Genesis in this tree. Since I already explained the previous one, I'm going to go real quick with this one. Uh, it is pretty much like the other one. Simply based on the tree created by Cordovero. Moshe Ben Cordovero. In this case, we have creation as told in Genesis 1 as the Cordovarian tree of life. The same, 32 paths of wisdom. The 10 Elohim said, connected also with the 10 commandments, are in the Sefirot. The 22 times that Elohim appears, connected to the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet, are the paths. 10 Elohim said in yellow, 3 Elohim made in orange, 7 Elohim saw in red. 12 times the title Elohim appears in light blue. <laughs> That's how they all appear in the tree. Ten sephirot, yellow, three mothers, the horizontal paths, I already said that, seven double vertical paths, and twelve elementals diagonal paths. 
in Genesis 1 29 it says and Elohim said see I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food that is in 129 so it basically when he already created everything and he's talking to men 129 look how it says and Elohim said so he did say it <laughs> that's why I added this one in the Keter outer part of the previous tree however since in this tree we have the sefirah for knowledge and remember that knowledge is the outer part of keter that's why in this case i separated what i had in one sefirah in the previous tree in the previous tree the inner of keter was in the beginning of him created the outer of keter was i give you every green herb for food however in this case we have the sefirah of knowledge um in the tree so since knowledge that is the outer part of keter i include it i give you every green herb for food as knowledge i hope that is understood at this moment in creation even the tree of knowledge of good and evil had been given to men like i explained previously when we study when we read it which means he was given free will as he was also given the commandment not to eat of his fruit. So when Yahweh created everything and he said, I give you everything, he allowed Adam to eat of the, the tree of knowledge. However, when Yahweh told Adam not to eat of it, that is the moment when Yahweh gave Adam free will. Because if he could have done anything, then that was not a manifestation of free will free will had to do with men being free of disobeying being free to disobey basically so when when yahweh told adam not to eat of one tree it was activating free will in men that's why it says at this moment in creation even the tree of knowledge of good and evil had been given to men which means he was given free will as he was also given the commandment not to eat of his fruit thus elohim gave adam the option to either do elohim's will or his own that is the point when yahweh gave the first commandment the, f the first order then is the moment when yahweh gave free will man was free to do the will of yahweh or his own will and through it would gain knowledge of what is good and what is evil when you do your own will you end up doing evil when you do Yahweh's will, you end up doing good. So we have to align our will with the will of Yahweh. That's why we pray and we ask for His will to be done. If we align our will with the will of Yahweh, we're only going to do good, of course. So, uh, in this first half, we see in the beginning Elohim created. That is the first saying that appears but since has to do with keter the nothingness ain then that is the only one in which yahweh doesn't use the words in the torah that say elohim said this is the only one like i already explained the spirit moving upon the waters and then elohim said let there be light then he said let there be a firmament after he made the light he created the firmament so that's why the horizontal path during the creation in the second day until he finished the firmament in Bina understanding when we understand that there is a firmament above us we get to understand a lot of things about this world that's why understanding has to do with firmament light has to do with wisdom Uh, then in the middle, where, where is that? Well, that is the 11th, Sephira. That is the 11th, and to, so I'm going to read it at the end. Then after firmament, from let there be light comes gather the waters. From firmament comes green herb. And from firmament and let there be light, they both go down to create lights. The lights that will be in the firmament. 
and that will transmit the light. So, the light that Yahweh created on the first day would go through the lights that He created on the fourth. And the lights that He created on the fourth, He put them in the firmament that He made on the second. So that's why you can see the first and the second day, Hogma and Bina, let there be light and firmament. They both go to the lights that Yahweh created. Then he gathered the waters, the green herbs. Um, below, well, let me see from the ones that are on your screen. He set the lights on the firmament. He called the dry land earth and the waters he called sea. Called the lights, the light day and the darkness he called night. See how here where the lights appear in the sephirah that actually is connected with the sun, Tiferet, balance. In the sephirah that represents balance is where everything is going to before going to men. Everything is connected in the lights because the lights are necessary for the functioning of nature, of this world. So through the sun, the herbs grow, animals need it, of course, and there are certain connections between the lights and the waters of the sea. So we see how everything is connected right here. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. He used the lights to separate. He called he used the lights to bring balance. He called the dry land earth and the waters he called sea. Again, separating waters from land and giving name to it. Like when you receive light, you receive knowledge. When you receive knowledge, you get to understand what to call things. <laughs> like when Adam received knowledge to give a name to each of the animals. So through the lights... Came, to, came the understanding to give a name to everything that was being revealed through that light. That's why here we see uh, those paths. Then below, below those, we see when man was created, once again. And through man came the blessing over them. And over earth itself. In his image he created them and blessed them. He created the, get, the great sea creatures. He blessed them also. Remember that the beast of the earth. Yahweh did not bless them. and uh, He did not tell them to be fruitful. That's why there are animals that go extinct. But when it comes to the sea and flying creatures. I mean the sea and flying creatures. Yeah. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. That's why we also see a blessing there. He created the great sea creatures and blessed them. He made men in his own image and blessed them. That's why these two paths go to the blessing. Everything that he made, he saw it and he blessed it. Remember that the Elohim saw was written in red. That's why and Elohim saw everything that he made. And Elohim saw the separation of the, the light and the darkness. And Elohim saw the light. And Elohim saw the land and the sea. And Elohim saw the sea and the flying creatures. Elohim saw the, gar the green herbs. Elohim saw the beast of the earth. In orange is the Elohim made. Elohim made the beast of the earth. Elohim made the sun and the moon. Elohim made the firmament. Yellow, Elohim said. That's why Elohim said let there be light. Elohim said let, it, let there be a firmament. Elohim said gather the waters. Let there be green herbs, let there be lights, sea and flying creatures, beasts of the earth, and let us create man in our own image. Ten Elohim said, three Elohim made, seven Elohim saw, and twelve times that the name Elohim, the title Elohim appears. Elohim blessed them. Elohim created them in his own image. Elohim in his own image, he created them. Elohim created the grain, the great sea creatures. And what it says on the right is the fact that Adam took the fruit is the reason why the place for the sephirah of that remains empty and is not depicted on most representations of the tree because Adam took the fruit of knowledge. In Genesis 2, 16, 17 we read, And Yahweh Elohim 
commanded the men, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. At that moment free will was activated. You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That, uh, death is something bad. That's why the knowledge of good and bad would bring death. Because people would have to experience all that has to do with the bad, with the evil. So that's why Yahweh, basically, this commandment is not just an order. It's a advice. Yahweh is basically saying, don't eat of it so that you don't die. Don't eat of it so that you don't experience anything evil. Simple as that. So when people ask, why is there evil in this world? Because men did not obey Yahweh. Why is there injustice in this world? Because men wanted to experience injustice. They wanted to experience evil. Each person, when a person disobeys the Creator and sins, at that moment, that person is agreeing with a world full of evil. At that moment, that person is part of the problem. And I say that so that we understand that the only way that we can rectify this world, our lives, is by obeying Yahweh. Genesis 3.6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, listen, was good. She forgot about the evil part. She just thought about the good. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, she fell for the appearances. She went according to the appearances, not according to the truth. Not according to the commandment that Yahweh had given Adam. She decided to follow her emotions, the imagination. That's why the serpent went to Eve. Bef did not go to Adam because Adam would not have obeyed. Adam obeyed his wife. He was influenced by his wife. The serpent knew that. That's why the serpent went and spoke to Eve while she was alone. So she fell because of appearances, because of the emotion, the imagination. That it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise. And the tree desirable to make one wise. She, she saw the good in it. She saw that she could become wise. But she did not understand that she could also become dumb. Because both are possibilities. Through the knowledge of good and evil, you can become like... Um, wise like she's saying or you can become dumb like an animal which is how many people have become sadly because of following spirits evil spirits doctrines of demons etc so in the tree desirable to make one wise she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And just to finish, the eleventh is that is the fruit that they took, which is interesting that the eleventh saying would go in the fruit or the sefira that they took. Why is that interesting? Because the actual saying is I give you every green herb for food. I give you every green herb for food. Then the commandment was given. And then Eve came and took from the tree the knowledge. So she took from the tree. And the saying that goes with that sefira is actually the moment in which Yahweh was given men the authority or the right to eat. Of every tree. So we see there the connection. So that the sefira of knowledge that actually represents free will. When we have knowledge of what is good, then we can we can use our free will. But when we do not have knowledge, somebody is going to use the free will that Yahweh gave that person. Basically, that somebody is spirit or a demon. When a person falls into sin, that person 
becomes a slave of sin. And that sin is connected to a spirit that is taking that free will that the person has to do what the spirit wants. So, my point is, that is connected with the saying that says, give you every grain herb for food. Then Yahweh gave the commandment. And then Eve came and took that fruit of knowledge, activating free will. So free will is connected to that. Free will is connected to knowledge, to the full of knowledge. And therefore is connected to the second coming. And that is why the last one falls into sin. Because as the tree of knowledge, he had to experience evil and experience good. Yahushua, the tree of life. Life is good. Life is, is uh, well, Yahweh's plan is for life to be wonderful. Unfortunately, for men in this world, many don't know what life is even though they are breathing. So, since life is positive in every way, Yahushua came and fulfilled the Torah in every way. The last one comes as the tree of knowledge of the Father through the Son, the life. And that is why the last one had to experience evil before coming to the knowledge of good, which is the Father.